great honor for me to participate in this highly scientific webinar. Uh, uh, many, many, many thanks to my great prof, Dr. Saad Mahdi, for allowing this valuable chance for me to introduce my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Aida, Dr. Navini Samar, and Dr. Sharif. It's a great honor to start today a highly scientific uh, program, uh, starting with Dr. Uh, Aida al Baradi. Uh, she is a consultant of uh, anesthesia in Adaraya Hospital. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, in the name of God, most merciful, most graceful. Uh, I really appreciate that you give me this opportunity to precipitate in, you know, in very interesting topics particularly in, you know, cardiac, you know, surgery and other types of surgery. Uh, so our topic is about, you know, delirium, post, you know, cardiac surgery. Uh, why I choose, you know, these topics? Because first I want to know what is it and how and who is at risk and what, why it matter and what, you can do about it. My aim of this, you know, broadcast is first I want to define what's delirium and why it's important, what is, you know, the pathophysiology and how we can recognize it, who's at risk and who can, how we can prevent it with, you know, pharmacological or non-pharmacological treatments. Well, Definition, very simple definition of delirium. It's, you know, acute, you know, decline in mental status or in other way, we can say acute confusional status or we call it, you know, episode of brain failure. Clinical features is the following. First is acute onset, disturbances in the consciousness, cognitive, or perception, and it is, you know, fluctuating in the course. Well, what is the type of delirium? It's the three main types. First, you know, is hyper or hypo, and hypo with a mixed type. But in cardiac, you know, surgery, what's the commonest? It is, you know, hypoactive. It's occur in adult, more than 70, or, you know, in palliative, characterized by, you know, sleepy, quiet, and withdraw from the environment and can be mistaken from, you know, depression. Uh, uh, the other, you know, hypoactive and mixed delirium, it's, you know, difficult to recognize it and maybe, you know, worse, you know, prognosis and grave prognosis. <coughs> the first time is, you know, the hyperactive, and the patient will be restlessness, agitations, and aggressive. So why it's all of this is important? Because in our you know, practice, we have the following incidents and the statistics have been proved from you know, cardiothoracic and you know, other subspecialty. In cardiothoracic surgery, 2022, they say the incidence is around, you know, 25 to 54. That's number one. And number two, in palliative care and ICU, cardiac surgery, 85. In, you know, in, in general, you know, after general surgery, it's about 10 to 15. And in the medical floor is 20 to 30%. And in long stay sitting, you know, in the hospitals is 10 to 34. Well, all of this, it's, you know, predisposed, you know, among all of the statistics that 50% over 65 will get, you know, delirium or, you know, after two days, after two years, they will die and have very, you know, domestic and bad, you know, prognosis. How we recognize, you know, delirium? Well, we can recognize it by 
First, you know, either sign and symptoms, which you can see it from, you know, agitations, you know, depression, hallucination, inability, you know, to sleep, lack of cooperation, and lack even with, you know, social cooperation. Or, you know, sleepy and he is lack of, you know, lack of, you know, appetite and co-op with, you know, other, you know, personality. Is that the only? No. But it can be also assessed by other tools, which we call it, you know, a present, you know, in psychiatry and neurology called, you know, 480s or, you know, CAMs. 480s, it's, you know, characterized, you know, by, okay, it's, you know, first, you know, alertness and, you know, change, you know, uh, of the, you know, sleep, attention, and, you know, at, you know, fluctuation of the moods. And CAMs, you know, it's again, you know, characterized by, you know, first, you know, difficulty, you know, to assess the level of consciousness or, you know, disorganized thinking, okay, inability to talk and acute, you know, mental status. Well, that's, you know, that's number one. Number two, that's by, you know, yani, a neurological and psychology. But we can assess it in very nice way, which we call it, you know, by look in the words, punch me. B, recognize the pain, okay? And C, the nutrition, is he eating or has loss of appetite? <clears throat> then, you know, the, the activity with, you know, go up with the, with the environment and the nutritional status and, you know, the other, you know, functions. What is, you know, the, you know, consequence of this too? If it is not well recognized early, so it will be disturbing not only for the family because long stay, but increase the incidence of dementia. It's also, you know, more complications such as the patient will get infection or fall or pressure sore. It's also, you know, carry high, you know, mortality rates. And this is what I'm telling you for ATs, alertness, you know, attention, change in the fluctuation. And this is, you know, the camp. Well, why we miss, you know, this one? We miss it either because of pre-existing dementia or less acute presentation, fluctuating in the presentation and heterogenic, you know, co cooperation and co-presentation because may present with depression, anxiety, or, you know, mixed or, you know, delirium. Well, who's, you know, the risk factor for this patient? Particularly, I'm asking in, you know, cardiac surgery. In general, cardiac surgery, we classify it into pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. And then, you know, other risk factor. In cardiac surgery, the duration stay in ICU itself, the duration of ventilation, presence or absence of anemia while he's ventilating, presence of lactic acid and, you know, more fluid, you know, pellets. Well, and this is, you know, we have to recognize one thing, that the patient is in cardiopulmonary bypass. And this, you know, cardiopulmonary bypass is characterized by a lot of, you know, complicated and very stressful. First, you know, while the patient in cardiopulmonary, drugs induced delirium, such as benzodiazepine, drugs and opioid, microemboli, wider, it's air, while the surgeon putting, you know, his, you know, cannula, or from, you know, iatrogenic blood, or, you know, showering emboli, which fat or air and the duration of, you know, cardiopulmonary bypass. Pre-op, everybody is missing the very important pre-op. Old age, DM, 
type of surgery, cardiac surgery, and type of carotid artery surgery, particularly of you know New York classification four and three. Pre op is he dementic or he is you know anxiety or bipolar, a mild you know cognitive, and lastly but not leastly alcoholic. The pathophysiology. It's still not well understood, but potential mechanism is, okay, inflammation while the patient in cardiopulmonary bypass changes in the neurotransmitter. And the commonest one is acetylcholine, corticosteroid and interleukin-6. But the latest articles in, you know, uh, uh, neurology, they concentrate about the acetyl, you know, choline, which it shows and manifest as a cause predisposing of, you know, uh, delirium, electrolytes and metabolic disorders, and hemodynamically changes while hypo or hyper, and, you know, unable to, you know, maintain good cerebral perfusion. Well, how we can prevent all of this? Before we ask ourselves how we can prevent, well, we can say to all over the world, delirium is medical emergency. And we have three categories to prevent it. First, you know, pharmacological, number two, non-pharmacological, and third, you know, combined with, you know, the family. Before, you know, uh, prevention, we have to assess the patients, okay, by A, B, C, D, E, F. A, assessment. B, breathing. C, cross, you know, uh, uh, cross, you know, uh, cross, you know, uh, the, you know, sedation. For monitoring the delirium and, you know, E, early mobilization. And F, you know, family communication in very, very, very nice to organize for them what's the story, bypass it in simple method and give him the message how to communicate with their patients and how to be as angel with their, you know, patients. That's, you know, number one. Number two, there is, you know, reversible causes such as correct, you know, the hypoxia, correct, you know, the infection, correct, you know, the pain. All of my patients in ICU, they are pain and, you know, we have to give, you know, hearing and, you know, visual and to promote, you know, good sleeping and allowing sleeping hygiene and good, you know, early mobilization and ensure adequate hydration and bowel, you know, function. Finally, you know, co-op with all of this, you know, characteristic and if the patient himself wants anything, we can tell. Even we can identify early and, you know, early and, you know, discharge from ICU and from the hospital to, you know, increase the sympathy of the patient and encourage him to get from this dilemma. Well, we have, you know, to delirium, we have to take tip and, you know, tops, First, look for all of the patient's circumstance, mainly pain control. Sleep, ask if he need alcohol or when he stop visual and, you know, hearing, you know, uh, aids to cope and, you know, give him paper to express about what exactly he wants and let him to be oriented with family and the family to be oriented with them, listen, and allow the family and the friends to visit, you know, in the visiting time and then visiting time. So what, what we can do by all of this, all of the steps, you know, it will tell the patient that, you know, not, I don't want the patient to be wake up in the night and, you know, take, you know, the sticky tubes from the patient such as chest for Foley's catheter, Foley's catheter, you know, and NG catheter to be, you know, relaxed, you know, let him to sleep in nice, you know, environmental and good, you know, 
environmental, give him the meal, whatever he wants, providing that consider about, mm -hmm. you know, his, you know, condition and let him to co-op, cooperate and incorporate, not with the family, friends, even, you know, with the medical staff. And this is the plan of, you know, family. We are, any questions, we are ready, communicate with the family, orient, you know, the family about their patients, any, you know, active engagement, we are ready either. And let the family to do, you know, rounds with me as in ICU and any questions, they can precipitate it to me. In European society, uh, I precipitate in, you know, World Delirium Awareness, which it is healed, you know, in March 11. And they, they are, you know, recognize it in very simple, give, you know, the patients the control pain, give the hearing and visual, okay, stay well hydration, give him good nutrition, allow, you know, the pass of motion, not to get, you know, away from constipation and relieve him from constipation and let him to enjoy, you know, with tools and to enjoy with the films, with, you know, radios, with, you know, audiovisual. And lastly, we are here and precipitate everything. And all of this, what we call it is, you know, psycho, you know, uh, and, you know, mechanical and non-mechanical, you know, factors to, you know, relieve, you know, the uh, delirium. Pharmacological, well, in my practice and in my experience too, we used first line Brisidex infusion, 0.1 to point, you know, 0.2 mic per kg, and it's excellent. Haloburidol, we give it in incremental doses, 0.1, wait and see, and then, you know, 0.2, wait and see. And lastly, but not leastly, Risperidal. Well, everybody will ask me about, you know, the benzodiazepine, but it is, you know, the least on the list. So at the end, I will give, you know, home message that all of the, you know, papers, it will tell that we need to work more and more, you know, encouragement to find out, you know, find out what is, you know, the, you know, determined integration of the delirium. We need more research. Number two, identify what is the other risk factors in cardiopulmonary bypass because it's still not well known. And number three is delirium is teamwork between cardiac surgeon, intensives, psychiatry, and the neurology. Four, early recovery post anesthesia and surgery, post cardiac surgery must be reviewed because not all of the center they extubate, you know, the patient as early as possible. But we are in Saudi Arabia, we extubate, you know, cardiac patients less than 24 hours, and that make the developmental of delirium. So we have to organize this, you know, eraser for cardiac, you know, surgery. Well, we have to be all of the time, pay, treat the patients as, Patience is a virtue, not as a number. What I mean, because delirium, it takes days, weeks, and, you know, months. So we have to treat the patients and give them the enough time and the duration to relieve from this, you know, problem. So be patient with the patients and, you know, not the numbers, how many days or, you know, when, how, and just be calm, quiet, and patient with the patient. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much that you are listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Aida. Thank you. A very informative and, and, and amazing lecture. Thank you. Of course, assembly, we will summarize some points. Uh, you. Uh, uh, 
stress upon the age of the patient, the type of, of, opera of operation, and how the patient if, if cooperative or uncooperative or have uh, some um, dementia or drug dependency will augment the uh, post, uh, delir or post uh, uh, cardiopulmonary uh, bypass uh, delirium incidence. Uh, your uh, home message is very elegant. Thank you, Dr. Aida. Uh, really, till now, we have no question. Only one question for Dr. Aida, and we're waiting for any question from our elegant attendee. Uh, the question for Dr. Aida, are you ready? Yes. Um, someone asked you about the production of uh, delirium, post-operative delirium, and how do you manage not to, and not to uh, complicate it by dementia? Okay, how do you reduce? The patient will suffer from the uh, delirium, post operative delirium, and how you to protect uh, this patient from uh, going to have dementia. Lastly, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. It is very nice, you know, questions uh, to prevent, you know, delirium post op. Uh, we have first to take, you know, pre op history very well. Number one. Number two, localize what is the risk factor uh, and, you know, try to control it and optimize, you know, this risk factor. Uh, number three, prepare, you know, the patients uh, pre-op to the optimal, you know, condition. Uh, number four, you know, uh, we have to avoid, you know, multi, you know, uh, pharmacology and to make, you know, the patients in simple infusion, you know, as, 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 as much as we can. For example, oral hypoglycemic, we can shift it one or two days, you know, to insulin and to control his blood sugar. If he's, you know, an antihypertensive, we have to stop the oral and, you know, try, try to get it into, you know, IV. And, you know, the type of the surgery, if he needs, you know, high risk, you know, consent, we have to localize all of the area and to scope what's going on. Uh, that's, you know, from pre-op and preparation, you know, of the patient. Uh, we have also, you know, if he has history of dementia, we can, you know, do also, you know, the MRI or CT to say that the patient has atrophic, you know, brain, and that will not miscarry, miss, you know, understand or mistaken by, you know, delirium. So he is already having dementia, this patient. Uh, number three, avoid the drugs that precipitate, you know, uh, delirium, and we can substitute it into, you know, uh, very rapid, you know, onset of drugs. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, we can give a lot of articles and, you know, in cardiac and in neurology, we can give prophylactic dose, pre-op of, you know, dexaetomidate, okay, to prevent, you know, the, you know, delirium or, you know, uh, one which is, you know, antipsychotic drugs, we can start them, you know, preoperatively. And this is all how to prevent, you know, pre-op, you know, delirium. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aida. Thank You're you. Welcome.